Welcome to the Second Mix Podcast, where we reflect, revise, and remix our lives. On Second Mix Saturdays, we do it with other people. Today, we're lucky enough to have John Davis, the corporate action hero, with us. He's got a really amazing story. He was at one point in his life paralyzed. We'll hear all about that, but he actually had his back broken, and he could not move. They were He was told that he, he could never walk, and things there... Uh, changed everything for him. Now he goes around and speaks and he actually has in his show, he calls up a volunteer on stage and that volunteer takes a whip and whips a target out of his hand, which is absolutely incredible. And it seems pretty dangerous. That's where I dig in with John. So uh, let's get into, get in there and take a look. So you were saying you whipped targets out of these people's hands. What do you mean? But like with a whip, with a whip, with a whip. Uh, I'm known as the corporate action hero. Um, I actually go into corporations, and when I speak to um, companies, I use whips and nunchucks and co- a lot of comedy. And, and basically, I go in there, and I, and I show people what they're capable of. And I start the event by, by whipping targets out of somebody's hand. And I end the event by, in under five minutes, training someone else to crack a whip and take targets out of my hand. Wow. Yeah. That's and awesome. It, that's that's really cool. It's pretty cool. It's a, it's it's literally a, man, a process of ma- leveraging the present moment, managing their fear, and getting them to take an action. Once I get once I get that, it's what I call the five F's, which we okay. can get into if you want to get into that at some point. But um, the five F's uh, literally hack the fight or flight response. So I'm managing their fear and I'm getting them to get very focused on what they're trying to achieve and then take a bold action towards it. Well, I was reading it on your website earlier today about the five F's, and it really did uh, pique my curiosity about what they are. So actually, now is as good a time as any. Let's, uh, let's talk about it. What are the five F's, and how did you come up with them? What are the five F's, and how did I come up with them? <laughs> well, that's a, it's a convoluted story, and I'll try to get through it as quick as I can just to get all the information in. Um, when I was a young man, I had dreams of being a stuntman and a fight director, and I ended up hanging out. Uh, at Renaissance festivals. And I met two of the top fight directors in the country who thought I had a lot of talent. And so when uh, they saw that talent, they decided that they wanted to be a part of my growth as an actor and a combatant. So they gave me their training for free. And I got into stage combat. And I got, at that point I was also going for my black belt in Taekwondo and I was really fit and buff and muscular and had long Fabio hair back then, as opposed to this (laughs) Telly Zavalas look I have now. And then, um, I ended up, uh, a buddy of mine called me up and said, hey, can you come help me unload my van? And I said, sure, no problem. So I came out to his house to help him unload his van. He was a professional potter. And as I, as I unloaded his van of 80-pound boxes of clay, uh, the first box I picked up, I lifted it up, I twisted, and I turned to set it outside of the van, and my spine broke in two. And wow. when, I mean, when I say my spine broke in two, I mean literally my spine broke in two. I collapsed. I was paralyzed. And they took me to the hospital and the doctor said, you have a condition known as spina bifida occulta. And I said, gesundheit. <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about. But it ended up being that I have three vertebrae that never formed properly at birth. And that day with the extra weight and the twisting, I literally broke the upper half of my spine off of the bottom half of my spine and pinched off my spinal column. I'm lucky I didn't sever my spinal column. Yeah. <clears throat> but the doctor told me that uh, they weren't sure I was ever going to walk again. And they also said to me that um, even if I did walk, I would never have a physical career. And while I was lying there in the hospital bed, somebody gave me a book called the Tao Jeet Kune Do, and, which is a book by Bruce Lee. I own so another, it. <laughs> do I you own, own that it? Yeah. book. Yes, I do. So, so, Bruce, so when Bruce wrote that book, he was in traction in the hospital. And, and he was just told he'd never do martial arts again. And... So this was a very apropos book for me to read at the time, you know, so I'm yeah. reading this book and I, and you know, if you've read that book, you know, that it's, it's more, more philosophy about martial arts than, than the, you know, a set of katas, you know what I mean? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I, I, a couple of things I leveraged in there was, was staying very present, being in the moment and uh, the mental flexibility aspects, you know, the being like water aspects of Bruce Lee. Um, was being staying very mentally flexible. So I had to come to a point where in my moment, I could choose somebody else's belief about my future or take my own beliefs. 
and I chose to take my own beliefs and not the doctors. And that led me to go on to do over 4,000 live comedy sword fighting stunt shows all over the world, including wow. the front lines of Iraq and Afghanistan on six USO tours. Um, and that, that comedy show was called Hack and Slash. And it was sword fighting and zip, zip lines and you know towers and you know, jumping off towers and you know, crazy show. Really fun, really funny show too. And as I realized that over the years of doing that, that I was enjoying the time off the stage more than I was the time on the stage, because what was happening was I was, I had formalized what I believed, how I, how I believed that I had, had brought myself back and I had formalized it into what I call the five F's. And so what I did was I found that I was helping people achieve more in their life sitting after the show with my audience than when I was on stage. Okay. But yeah. I was, yeah, but I still wanted to do whips and nunchucks and all the cool things that I did in the show. So I said, how do I, how do I leverage both those things? How do I leverage helping a lot of people and still get to do comedy and whips and nunchucks? So I created the corporate action hero. And so now what I do is I go into corporations and I using a you know, fun interactive program. They're laughing. It's out of the box, no PowerPoints, real interactive in the room experience. I take people from, um, the place of, you know, that corporate mentality of, you know, we're, we're always watching our backs to, I'm an, I'm an action hero. I'm someone who can achieve anything and create the outcomes. And so by the end of my, by the end of my speech, as I said, one of the things I do is I bring the most timid person I can find in the room onto the stage. And in under five minutes, they're cracking targets out of my hand with a whip. And it's like the, the audience is going crazy and they're screaming and they're, you know, of course, that person being timid has a life changing experience, but anybody who knows that person in the audience knows, wow, that person did it. And then they have an experience as well. And the five F's are basically fearlessly focused with faith, follow through with flexibility. And what they, what it's all about is hacking that fight or flight response, that fear response that we all have. And we hack it, hack it by, by first acknowledging what we're in a fear and then going through the process of breaking down those fears and then taking bold actions towards the outcome and creating a, a new subconscious mind because the subconscious mind is where we carry our beliefs about who we are and what we do. And so by changing the subconscious mind, you're actually changing the outcome itself. Wow. Well, that does sound fascinating. I think that that is uh, it's pretty amazing that you do go. that. I, th I think it's a, it's a good, um, good strategy to find somebody in the audience. How do you choose the timid person? How do you figure that out? Well, as I said, I've done over 4,000 live comedy sword fighting shows. I'm very good at, at, buy, at reading people sure. in the audience. When I walk out in the audience, I, I, I watch them. You can always see the ones who, who are like closing themselves down physically and, you know, trying not to catch eye contact and who are very, um, <laughs> well, they think they're invisible. You know, they, they're, they're just trying not to be anything. And then you see the other ones who are like the class clown and they're in your face. They're looking at you. Who choose me? Who choose me? I'll never choose them right. for, for, two, for, for two reasons. One, they're creating their own experience and they can come on stage and derail a show really quick. <laughs> and number two, by, by, they have no real impact because if they're known as the class clown and the people who will try anything, then they're not a really good impact for what I'm trying to, trying to convey. I want the person who's most timid. Right. Yeah, that's that's outstanding. Um, I was just thinking about that uh, whole volunteer choosing thing. I, I used to do magic a lot. And oh, you you yeah. are exactly right that you can kind of start to pick out who you definitely are not going to call up as a volunteer. <laughs> right, right, right. Because, 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 you know, the class clown luck, because nine times out of 10, they're they're funny in their environment. They're not necessarily funny on stage. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, You're right, yeah. derailing a show and oh. doing their own thing, and oh man, turning cards over when they're not supposed to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did a, <clears throat> I did my comedy show. We did there was one funny routine in it that we had a bed of nails, and I'd lay my partner down on the bed of nails, and for, you know I don't like I don't like you know misconveying to the audience that this is true. So to me, it was a comedy routine. I wasn't trying to say that bed, beds of nails are dangerous. But the whole routine was basically he didn't want to go on the bed of nails and we had to sword fight to see who's going on a bed of nails. And then he ends up on the bed of nails. And then all the way through the process, I'm picking up cinder blocks and I'm setting them on them. 
but I'm but I'm picking him up and I'm setting him on his crotch. And then he's then he reaches down and moves it, and I keep talking and I with just gesturing, I pick the block up again and drop it back on his crotch and all this <laughs> stuff. And then at one point I, <laughs> I I I say, "You guys should never try this at home." And I hit the block and he pees across the stage. Okay. You know, so there's all this funny stuff around this routine. So it's a comedy routine. So I finished the entire comedy routine and the class clown who wasn't in the show, sitting in the front row, yeah. we finished the show. He got up, he ran on stage and he did a shoulder roll across the bed of nails. Okay. And I'm like, you're an asshole. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. You, you, you just negated the entire comedy show. Right. By, by trying to take away the one thing that they, they had to suspend their belief on. Right. You know, yeah, what a jerk, you know? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Sadly, we run into people like that in our lives. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? I'm like, I've done over 4,000 of those shows and there've been very few of those moments, but you do, you do very quickly learn who not to choose. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So one more thing to unpack. Um, is it, do you find it beneficial in, in booking your show to, Say I don't have a PowerPoint because that sounds oh, awesome to me. Absolutely. Because they are so oversaturated in the corporate world. And a lot of speakers rely, depend, you know, an anchor themselves to that PowerPoint. And I say I don't want I not only do I not want a PowerPoint, I don't want a screen or a projector right. to remind them of PowerPoints. Right. <laughs> I I want I want an interactive in the room experience. And I, you know, my background, I'm, I, because of what I do, I also studied neurolinguistics and hypno hypnosis. Okay. And so I want to, I want to create my own anchors, right? And so the, one of the reasons I do use a whip is because the anchor of the explosive sound is huge. You know, six months down the road, when, when they haven't seen me anymore, their boss can say, remember what the whip guy said, and the plosive of the whip will bring back all their content. Right. So, you know, so I'm constantly anchoring stuff with people. It's just like when, when I bring that person on stage who tech cracks the target out of my hand, you know, I never talk about whips. I talk about fishing. And, and again, I'm talking about that calm, serene, learning to cast a fishing rod. And then I give them a whip and then they, they cast a fishing rod and it cracks. Right. And once it cracks though, I do this thing where I go, did you hear it crack? So I get them to acknowledge that it cracked. And then I go, I do this, this gesture called a, a hypnotic wipe where you go with your hand across the screen, across their face, you go, so you already know how to make it crack and you follow it with an anchor of knowledge. So what I just did was I took them from learning a skill to knowledge a skill. Basically, I shortened their, their learning curve. Okay. And that's it. Right. And then now what I'm doing is going, okay, now that you've got that, I pull out a target and they, they freak out, of course. And then their next fear is that they're going to hurt me. And I say, uh, I promise you're not going to hurt me. All I want you to do is look where you want it to go and cast your fishing rod. And they look where they want it to go and they cast their fishing rod and they take the target right out of my hand without hitting me. Wow. And, and it's all about managing their fear and getting them to, you know, understand that everything's going to be okay. Positive outcome. Do you, uh, do you ever get hit with the whip? I, you know, I've been hit once and it was an interesting thing because when you crack a whip, you know, there's, you know, when you see Indiana Jones, he always cracks a whip on something and swings on the, on the whip. That's, that's a total BS thing, by the way, uh, okay. because okay. you're not actually tying a knot up there. It's going to unravel as it's, soon as you try to okay. swing on it. Okay. Right? It's good right. to know. Good information. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but when you, crack, when you get to do the wrap, it's called a wrap. And when you get to a, do a wrap, if you crack the whip above your target, the recovery of the whip is the wrap. But the crack is where the energy is expended. So all the power is gone in the crack, and then it's just a, a, a whip in motion, right? Okay. And so, so you go kapow, and then it wraps around. So this person wrapped it around the arm in the speech, and I said, wow, we're not doing the advanced stuff yet. <laughs> you know, and it's like. That's on, right. <laughs> yeah. So it was like totally cool, totally cool. Right. You, you sure you. You sure you haven't cracked the whip before? <laughs> <You know? laughs> that is perfect, actually. <laughs> right, right. That makes it even more memorable for that particular audience. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, it was that that uh that routine has I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times. I had one close call, 
And it was the last time I chose a man because a, a man will go on stage and, with, and you put a whip in his hand and his testosterone kicks in. Right. So I always, I always choose a woman. Okay. And, and they, they nail it every time. In fact, if you watch my promo video on the first page of corporateactionhero.com, yeah. at the end of the video, you'll see four or five women taking targets out of my head. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So is this something, so you give them the whip. Is this something where it's kind of like, I, I don't want to use the term beginner's luck, but let's say the first time somebody does it, they kind of always get it because they're only focused on the one thing that you said, or is this something they can do a hundred times in, in a row? I make, I make sure they do it two or three times on, on stage. Okay. Because, wow. and the reason, the reason being is because, see, the thing, the thing is what messes people up is, is not their ability. It's their fear. And so they get fear. Now, now, what is fear? Fear is an emotional reaction to some future event that may or may not happen with the person focused on the negative outcome. Fear is simply negatively focused on certainty. And so I need to get them positively focused to not be in fear. Well, what, how do you get them to positively focus? You, first of all, by managing their fear, but second of all, by getting them to actually have an objective, the goal. So you already know how to make the whip crack. You already know how to do that. I promise you're not going to hurt me. There's, there's me taking it right away. Just look right here and cast your fishing rod. So all they have to do is really look right there and cast their fishing rod and, and leave all of that other junk out. Okay. You know, we all, we can achieve anything in life. You know, in my life, I, I after the, my back injury, I, I literally became a fight director, a stunt man, uh, an artistic director of theme parks, a college professor, and now a corporate, now a corporate speaker, right? I've worked with movie stars. I've worked with famous fight choreographers, the guys who did Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Highlander. I climbed Mount Sinai. I, I climbed Machu Picchu. I swam in the Blue Lagoons of Iceland. I, I have done the 30 countries now and done just amazing things. And it was all because I re- got rid of my fear and, and literally started focusing on what I was going to achieve po- positively. Okay. Fearlessly focus with faith, follow through with flexibility, right? I drop my fear. I get focused on my outcome. I believe I can do it. I take one simple bold action and then I just keep stacking positive actions on top of each other until the success comes to me. And then the last one being flexibility is when something comes up that seems contrary to what you're trying to achieve, realize that you're still going for your goal. And this thing came up to be addressed, not to stop you. And so if you, this thing comes up, you can go, okay, I have to address this I, or incorporate this or, or remove this so that I can get my goal. So and you just keep motion towards the goal and then you get the goals. <clears throat> you know, when you're, when in my life, the, those five F's have, I've watched so many people come out of the, their huge limiting beliefs. I had one woman I worked with who She was agoraphobic. She literally could not leave her house because she was afraid to go out. When she did go out, it was such a terrifying experience for her that she just couldn't handle it. So, you know, I was working with her and getting her to do her five Fs. After two years of working with her, two, two, two solid years, she took a solo trip to Africa, climbed a mountain and hung out with the gorillas of the Jane Goodall fame, you know, exactly. And she went by herself to Africa, right? And one of the reasons, one of the things in that process, I was driving down the road with her and I I love to drive and we're driving down the road and she says, why do cars merge with you easily? And I said, because I love to drive because I'm putting out this positive intention. You know, I have nothing but to see positive intention in my life. Right. When she drove, she drove so fearfully that her fear responses were creating fear responses in the people around her. You know, her timid driving was making the person merging timid. So it, it, you literally affect the world around you literally by what you're putting out and you affect your outcome by what you're putting out. Wow. Do you think that that is more, I mean, does it get into kind of the ethereal or spiritual? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Buddha says, what you think you become, you create your world. Gandhi says, be the change you want to see. Krishna said, you are the culmination of your thought. Uh, Jesus said, whatever you ask in God's name is granted. But Moses said, God's name was I am, not I will be or I was. Right. So basically he's saying right here, what you think about your present moment, what you believe about your present moment. Jesus also said, it's your faith that heals you. He never said it was your faith in me that heals you. He says, your faith, your belief, your confidence. 
that, that heals you, right? Greater works than I have done, you will do. The interesting thing about that one statement, the, um, it is uh, whatever you ask in God's name is granted, is not that statement. It's the next statement that no one ever quotes. And they really should, because the next thing he says in the Bible is, nothing will be impossible for you. And that's important because you, it, you are limitless. You are only limited by your own limited beliefs. And I am, I am living proof of it because there is no way that I should be walking right now. And I have literally jumped off of three-story towers. I've been on fire. I've done thousands of sword fights, gun fights. And, and, you know, I have done, I had a hugely physical career. I am living proof that this works. Wow. That's, a, that's definitely worth looking into then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One and thing I, I, I simplified it down to those five Fs. And by simplifying it, it makes it actually uniquely teachable and learnable. It is definitely, uh, the five F's is definitely unique and it def it's not what I expected, right? Usually mm -hmm. you hear, okay, here's the five F's and then you get a bullet point list and, there's right. a, and then you just throw like two sentences out at me and say, this is how to live your life. I love that. Right. Well, and, and when we get, you know, when I get into the five F's, I, I can go through the whole, the whole process of that. Like, you know, fear, I, talk, I talked about fearlessness, you know, I talk about the, how do you set fears aside? And it's really interesting because, <laughs> you know, fear, fear is the primal response. It's a literal survival response. And the first thing you do when, when anybody does when they get into a fear is they gasp for air, right? Most people, when they're afraid, they don't feel like they can breathe. Right. Well, it's not, that, it's not that they don't have air. It's that their lungs are full. And why are their lungs full? Their lungs are full so they can run further and faster because it's a primal response which means your body is in a survival mode, which means any other cognitive thinking has been pushed aside for survival because that's more important. So that's why actors on Broadway are trained that when they forget all their lines in front of their audience, they literally are trained to exhale and relax their muscles. <sighs> and all their lines rush right back into their head because it shuts off the fear response and turns on the cognitive thinking brain. You know, And then when I'm on the front lines of Iraq, I'm talking to soldiers, and I say, how do you do it? They say the same thing. Before they go in, they go, okay, we're doing this thing. And they take that exhale, right? Okay. But then they also, have the, they also have the next thing, which they say, but we have an objective, so it makes it easy for us. We can say, focus on our objectives. We've got fearlessly focus, right? And then, you know, their training up to that point has built them up to believe that they can achieve because they're the U.S. Army. That's what that whole concept is. We are the best army in the world. They have been built and trained to have that faith as they go, right? Um, the next, the, the next one is the hardest and that's the follow through actually taking the action. But if you're not taking an action, it goes back to number one. You're, you, there's a fear of stopping. You're scared moving. of something. Yeah. Right. So you have to stop and address that. Once you address that and you take, then you realize here, now here's where it gets, I go off into brain science a little bit. You only have one moment that you can think, do, and say anything. Your thought word indeed only live in the present moment. Your subconscious mind is literally a, a collection of present moment memories that have a sub underlying belief. And your subconscious mind has a second job is to show you whatever you focus on. So for me, I love Jeeps. I drive down the road. I see every Jeep on the road and every Jeep and every driveway. You know, I've had five of them. I have one okay. sitting in my garage right now, right? But I see Jeeps everywhere I go. That's because I consciously think Jeep and my subconscious mind shows me Jeep, right? And because it's now, now it's on autopilot, now I see Jeeps, so that drops into my subconscious mind that I just had a successful moment of seeing a Jeep. And so now I'm, I'm exponentially doing it. But people who focus on negative stuff, they are literally training their brain to run an autopilot on negative. That's why negative people always have negative things to think about. So we got fearlessly focused with faith, right? And that follow through is based upon those other, other ones. You know, so I have to be following through with making my present moment as positive as possible so I can stack all these present moments behind me to change my subconscious belief. And in spirituality, Jesus would call that being born again, starting over, right? You're starting and creating a whole new belief behind you. The interesting thing that I see with most people is they sit in this moment and they think they have to get to the outcome, but that's not the way the brain works. The way the brain works is, you're only here. So when you experience the outcome, it's going to be in your present moment. 
The only thing the future really is, is a place where you set goals for your next present moment. So the only way the next present moment comes to you is by taking small present moment actions here that are in alignment with that and making them successful. And so it comes to you. And then, of course, as I said, when something comes up that seems contrary to what you're trying to achieve, realize that your subconscious mind is showing you the next Jeep. It's showing you the thing that you have to address to get to the goal. And right. then you keep moving. Nice. So that's the, that's the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> that's, that's great, though. I can see why that is a fascinating speech. Uh, I, do, I do have a couple questions. First, I guess, when you were talking about, okay, if my mind is focused on negative, 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 the only way to change that is to focus on positive, positive, positive. Right. Are yep. we thinking like more like personal development speakers and the things that they say, or are we talking about just the things we want? Anything, anything you want and, 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 and personal development as well. I, you know, Tony Robbins says the same things. Wayne Dyer, the spiritual said the same thing. Zig Ziglar says the same thing. I love you know, Zig. They're all saying, they're all saying the same stuff. The interesting thing is, it's like, you know, I I used to speak at metaphysical centers as well, because I do know a lot about spirituality. My mom had her master's degree in liturgy in the Catholic church and was head of liturgical doctrine, which basically meant that anytime the priest wanted to do a sermon, he had to pass it by my mom. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. So that's how, how Catholic would, but when I turned 18, she said, John, spirituality is a personal journey. You need to find out whether you believe what we've been teaching you or whether you have a different belief. And I'm so glad she gave me that that out because I went on and I studied the Buddha and Krishna and, you know, Swami Narayan, the Baha'i faith, uh, Islam, you know, I went through it all. I studied every, and they're all on my shelf in the other room. And I find, I find truth in all of it and I find correlation in all of it. And so I tend to, Look at that. And then I look at Tony Robbins and, and Zig Ziglar and, you know, personal power and all that's all the same. It, it is all the exact same stuff. It's just worded to fit a different audience. Right. All repackaged. Right. So when you speak for corporations, how do you fit your five F's into trying to get people to work together? Cause that's what it, it looked like. You were really good at that. So how do you filter that into a team mentality? Well, well, just like, just like when a plane is going down and the oxygen mass fall, I work on the individual first and I get them realizing their own personal power. And so I get them, you know, you put your own oxygen mask, then you help others. So I start with working on the individuals in the, in the team, in the group, but then I, I, I explain to them that this primal response that they're dealing with, that they've now are working on and resolving is the same thing everybody around them is going through. So in sales, for instance, I can, I can come into a company and increase, increase their sales just by teaching them the five F's and showing them how their customers going through the process. You know, when I do that whip, when I do that whip target thing, that's just like a sale, right? I'm empathetically following, you know, as I, and sales is one thing. Now we go into leadership and when you're into leadership and sales and leadership, you know, they cross over, you're leading a person to a sale. Right. So in leadership, you have to be empathetic because you're a leader, not a dragger. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're going there, meeting them where they are and, and leading them somewhere. So you have to you have to take these five F's and realize, oh, I, I recognize the fear response. I, I empathetically feel where they are. Like if having the most timid person on stage, I could feel that she was afraid of being in front of those people. Right. Right. First thing I say, first thing I have the audience do is say. I turn to the audience and say, isn't she a rock star? And they cheer for her, right? So what she's afraid of not having is their love and affection or their acceptance. Right. And I give it, I give it to them first, right? So, so in sales and leadership, the five Fs are imperative because now you understand the process. You can shorten their learning curves. You can increase their productivity. And you can definitely achieve more of your goals. And, and that's just by understanding and knowing how to use it. So when you're working in a team dynamic, everybody in the team has the same, same situation. And the, the team itself is only as strong as the weakest attitude. And attitude is based upon fear. And so if, you, if people in the team can recognize where the others are on the 5 uh, you know, protocol in the 5F protocols, then they can then go, okay, 
let's address that fear and get and move on. Because once you address it, you, you get to actually create motion again. So one of the things I do in one of my speeches, I bring, you know, five guys on stage, I sit them down in chairs and I take all the chairs away. Right. And I do that first by number one, I never, I, I never ask them to come. I go over and I tap them and I, and, and I just tell them to come, but I have already, I've already established that I'm the funny jokey guy and we're doing funny things. So right. I've already created a positive work environment by creating the positive. And that's another thing I do is the first thing I do on stage is I whip targets out of somebody else's hand. And I choose that person without ever asking them. In fact, I go over and I, the only thing I ask them is what their name is. Say, What's your name? I start applauding and I walk back to the stage and they follow me. Okay. Right. Nice. <laughs> then I, I ask them after the whole thing's done, I've taken all the targets out of their hand and say, why'd you come to the stage? <laughs> I basically <laughs> negate the whole whip thing. You got to go, well, well, cause you asked me, I said, did I ask you? And I turned to the audience, did I ask him? And the audience says, no, you didn't ask him. And I said, it's because I, I came on stage. I created a positive work environment first by making jokes and laughing. I stepped off the stage. I clearly and effectively communicated what was going to happen. I said, I am going to choose someone from this audience. So everyone in the audience knew I was going to choose someone. And then as I walked through the audience, I made jokes about, you know, people averting their eyes. And I bet there's all kinds of jokes that I do all the way through going to the back of the house saying, I come back here because these people thought they got away with something, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I go through the whole thing. And by the time I finally get to the person, I, I usually look for the guy with the bald head because there's a series of jokes I can do about guys with bald heads. Right. Right. And right, so I walk over to a guy I said, looking for someone with an aerodynamic hairstyle and I walk over and I, I usually try to get behind them so they don't see me coming or they're trying to avoid looking at me. And I walk over and I rub the top of their head, which gets, it's a laugh. And I say, what's your name, sir? Bob. And I just say, <laughs> I walk to the stage and he, and he follows me to the stage. Right. You know, this, you know, you know how you do that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the whole, I, I say, well, why did that happen? He said, well, cause you asked me. I said, no, I said, I explained the whole situation. I, create a positive work environment. I effectively communicate what, what our goals were. And then because there was a positive work environment, anybody in the room would have gotten up and come up. And so you just came up because people want to be involved with something positive. Now on the, on the thing where I bring the five guys, I set them down in chairs. I get them to lay back on each other's laps and I take all the chairs away and they're suspended by each other. Okay. And, so, so, and now I tell them, okay, you know, when I first picked them, what was their, what, you know, what, who'd they have to put trust in? Who, who, that's the faith segment of my speech. I said, who'd they have to put faith in? I said, me. So as a leader, I had to express confidence as I chose. You know, I didn't go out there and say, would you please help me? I said, I said, you, come on, let's do this. Right. right. And I'm very confident we're doing this. Then I get them on stage. I said, then they lay, get them lay back on each other. And I take the chairs away. Who'd they have to put faith in then? Like so each other around, at that point. Each other, right. And so the team around you is your strength. I said, guess what? There's nobody. There. I said, no, here's the big thing I say. I said, guess what? Somebody in this room is smarter than you. I know it's hard to believe. Right. And then said, they laugh. And I go, I go, but when I just said that, somebody in this room just thought of you. And the reason that is, is because nobody has all the answers. We each have our part that we're better at. And it's by us each having our part and coming together, creating the whole that makes the business successful. So realize that you, that nobody in this room is more important than you. And so, so you create this dynamic team effect. I love it. I love it. This, this uh, paradigm, I can't remember what you called it. It's not paradigm. <laughs> it was started the with a P. Protocols. The protocols. That's beautiful. So the <laughs> protocols, and I can take those and apply them to me. And if everyone is applying them to themselves, but also then I have the, where is the person in their life right now, according to the line of this, these protocols. And you can right. say they're experiencing fear. What do I have to do to help them to get to the next level? And, not, and nine times out of 10, you're going to know what the fear is. You know, it, the, the number one fear everyone has is failing. They're, they're afraid of, and the reason they're afraid of failing is not because they're not getting the job done. It, the reason they're afraid of failing is because they'll look bad. They won't be accepted or loved in some form. And right. so you, you have to realize you have to, number one, give yourself permission to be fallible and give others permission to be fallible as well. 
and don't dwell on on the things that falter you know only dwell on the things that succeed you know because that present moments that you're stacking behind you they're supposed to be predominantly positive there's always going to be some one one of those moments that are going to mess up and the interesting thing about that is when one of them messes up, somebody who, who like, you know, I know a lot of people who, when they mess something up, they go, ah, I'm so dumb. I'm so dumb. Why did I do that? I'm so dumb. That's why I went bald. I was smacking <laughs> the hair. Right? But, but the thing is, all that's doing is wasting a moment. Beating yourself up is just wasting the next moment, which means you've now stacked an extra moment of negativity into your subconscious mind. What I had to do when I was getting out of that bed, when things didn't go the way I thought, I, just, I started just allowing myself to say it was silly. <laughs> well, that's silly because I am doing this. You know, I am becoming a stuntman, so it's silly that I can't move my legs. Right? right. That's, a, that's a huge response, right? Well, what happened? I can move my legs just fine. I still have spina bifida occulta. Nothing's changed. Okay. They, never put pins, they never put pins in my back. They never did any of that thing. I just, I actively work my muscles in my back, keep my back strong. And you now I'm 57 years old right now. And I've done, I've done more physical things in my life. Than, now, don't get me wrong. I feel a lot of the physical things I've done. <laughs> <laughs> and I can point out the scars on my face from various weapons. You know, okay. Rapier, broadsword, nunchucks. You know, it's like big, big <laughs> wow. age, right? <laughs> um, but, but the thing is, it's like, it's like, even those are joyful to me. Because I like... Look at that. Look at the, the scars on my face. Look at the gray hairs. I'm so proud of every darn one of them because I earned every darn one of them. <laughs> you know? Right. Exactly. It's the best. Right. It's a, it's because you can go back and you say, what could I have done? I could have stayed in right. bed. I could have lived another 60 years like in, in this bed or in a wheelchair and not. And I probably it. wouldn't have, I probably, because of the inactivity, I probably wouldn't have loved them, lived another 60 years. Right. And instead, you know, I, I I'm, I'm from a big Catholic family and, you know, I'm number six of seven wow, kids. Okay. And when I look at, you know, I, we've had, we have achievers in my family. My, my sister was head of, is like a, a, a mathematical whiz. She was very high up in the school board of the state of Delaware. My brother is a, is a NASA scientist and worked on this international space station and all those sorts of things. Right. right? And my other brother is an incredible musician and and, but when I look at the things that we've achieved in our lives, I've been to 30 countries around the world. I've, I've been on top of Mount Sinai and Machu Picchu and, you know, <laughs> I've done all these things and, and worked with Brad Pitt and David Duchovny. And I, you know, I've done all these amazing things in my life and I'm like, none of that would have been possible. And it's more than, you know, they've, they like I said, they're all high achievers, but they, they haven't done nearly as much as I have done just by knowing I can and, and taking those actions. That is outstanding. I, I am very happy that you came on the show today. I do. I've got a couple more questions for you, actually, if you've got a couple minutes, I, I, I am yours, my friend. I left the day open just for you. Outstanding. So once, when you found out that you were paralyzed, mm -hmm. how long between then and when you started reading like the Dao of Jeet Kune Do and started um, like, were you depressed for a season and then you got better or how quickly did the change happen? I'll let you you're, talk. You're going to, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. So the, the accident happened within a week. I had the book. A friend okay. of mine bro brought me the book because he knew what the story was in the book and he knew me really well. And so I had the book within a week. So once I, and I read and I devoured that book in a day. I was just okay. like, I was like, right. And, the, and like a day or so later, I really had a couple of days to ruminate on what I had just read. Right now, don't get me wrong. When the doctor said, you may never walk again and you'll never have a physical career. I went to dark places right away. Okay. So that day, you know, it was, but it was only a couple of days. Wow. It was only a couple of days. Cause I was like, that book was so perfectly timed. It got me before I could get too deep. Okay. Because if right. had it had it been weeks, I might not have recovered. I might not have recovered. But he, I got that book right away, and then, so I started leveraging the present moment and staying flexible. So what I did was, I on day one, I said, okay, 
today I'm working my neck muscles. And I just work my neck muscles. The next day I work my upper, my, my trapezius and my shoulders and my arms, right? And then I brought to my latissimus dorsi and then I slowly moved down my back. And then by day 22, I think it was, I flexed my hips, okay. which was b- below the injury. So wow. like, they, knew, they knew now I wasn't be positive, uh, paralyzed. By uh, about a week over a month, but month, a month to a month and a week, I was sitting up on the side of the bed. By another month, I was walking. And you know, before this, they would get me to my feet to try to get me to do things, but they would have to care, basically carry me. And I would just kind of move my legs along. But um, by, by the end of that time, I was, I was walking. By the end of six months, I was, I was walking fine and you know, back to almost normal life. At a year, I was probably back to what, you, what most people would consider a normal physical condition. At a year and six months, I was back to being the rock hard masculine self that I was before the accident. So it took a year and six months. And at a year and six months, I gave myself a gift. And that gift was that I climbed up on top of a three-story tower and jumped off. <laughs> <laughs> that's it well i guess it's a gift for some people <laughs> <laughs> well i can tell i i'll tell you an interesting interesting thing about that though when you're standing on top of a three-story tower and you've just gone through all that and you're looking down at that pad i can promise you you are not focusing on all you just went through you're focusing on where you're going to land okay that's- and and for for me i had to stay focused on that positive landing that positive goal Wow. Amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, I'm thinking because you brought it up. So Bruce Lee's book, um, there, there's one thing in there that really has always rung true with me. And that's essentially when you're engaging in contact with your enemy, you're going in basically believing you're going to win, but preparing to die. Like, you whether you're going to live or die, you approach with the same vigor. And that, right. that has helped me with any kind of personal development stuff to just say, I'm going to go for it. Like, should I start a podcast? So I, I could look like a fool. I could look stupid, whatever. I'm going to get out there and do it anyways. It's just, I want to do it. I'm right. pouring myself into it. Did, did that, uh, any of that kind of get into your, it sounds like that kind of stuff got into your personality. Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, I go, I go at everything full bore. And, and because if I'm the creator of my experience, it makes no sense not to, not to create in a very dynamic and positive way. And if I'm not creating that way, that means there's a fear that's mixed in there somewhere. Right. right. So I want to look, I want to go, okay, what am I doing? So <laughs> and it's funny because I, I often talk to people about speakers especially about setting fees how do you how do you set your fees right right i said i said well let's let's look at it from this point of view when i decided to shift from my stunt work and my comedy show to being a corporate speaker i the first thing i had to do is educate myself so i i started to, you know i wrote the speech i figured the whole thing out and then i booked myself to every chamber of commerce within 100 miles of my house to come give a free speech Right. And I, and I literally, I did a bunch of free speeches. And then I discovered as I was doing them that, that, that those free speeches will yield you a lot of other speeches, a lot of other free speeches. Right. Right. right, right. But then when I started throwing my, my price up, I said, okay, well, uh, and this is early on. This is way before what I, I'm a much higher than, I, than this now. But I was, my first fee that I set was $1,500. And it was like, okay, $1,500. Well, I discovered that $1,500 speeches get you more $1,500 speeches because you're now you're known as a $1,500 speaker. So I said, well, well, what is it that takes you to the next level? And then I, was, I realized that it's the confidence in yourself. It's you valuing what you do. And so for me, I had to go, how much am I, what, you know, what is my fee? How much of a, of a value do I bring? And I, and so I jumped up from 1500 to 5,000 and I got $5,000 speeches and they, they brought me more $5,000 speeches. And I jumped up to 10,000 and suddenly I had $10,000 speeches and 
the you know the mo there's a moment where you're where you're at five thousand and you're going you're going okay I'm going to ten and it's like you, know, you could get into the fear of that's doubling my fee, right? And the next time I was negotiating with somebody, I had, I had changed all of my marketing and all the platforms because you know, a lot of the speakers platforms have your range, right? And so nine times out of a ten they know what your range is, you know. And so I get on the, on the phone call and they're already very aware of what they're bringing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <And> so, <clears throat> so when they, they come in and they go, um, they go, uh, they're talking, 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 and suddenly they go, and what's your fee again? You know, they do that kind of like negotiation stuff. And, um, and um, I found it so empowering to say, I am a $10,000 speaker. Right. And then they say, are you negotiable? And I say, no, because I don't undervalue what I do. Right. Wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I get speeches, right? That's perfect. Right. It's yeah. interesting because the, the symbiotic relationship with you getting better every time anyways, to make it worth that. So right. So starting off for free and you probably stumbled on your first few. Right. And and then you just get better and better and your price keeps going up and up and the belief in yourself. It's like, it's like everything just kind of grows up together like a tree. Right. Right. Every, everything. Yeah. And you know, it's that those pr successful present moments, the more I stack these present moments of valuing myself and what I do, right. The more I stack those moments in there, the more, the, the better I get at what I do because confidence breeds um not I, would, I never say perfection but excellence you know confidence breeds excellence perfection is perfection is a subjective thing you know people it's only perfect for you it might not be perfect for somebody else but excellence is is a something we all can strive for and so your confidence will will literally breed your your excellence and so you have to make you know if you're a ten thousand dollar speaker you better bring a ten thousand dollar product Right. You know, and so right. you better, you, know, you better do it. And so, and I have found that, that, you know, the year before COVID, I spoke 70 times that year. I traveled over 200 days. Wow. And, uh, and to the point where it was like, okay, you know, I really should start thinking about upping my fee again so I can work less and make more money. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I was just doing the math in my head. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It's like, that's nice. Uh, well, and, and, and I do, you have to understand, I do a speech and if, if they book me for a full day, I'm doing multiple workshops, which are right. extra fees. Right. So yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of money in there. Right. And I don't have the book yet. And, and if I had my book done, which is in the process right now, if I had my book done, I'd be pre-selling the entire audience, the book. Right. That'll be great wow. too. Right. Right. So uh, I, I'm going to ask you the, question of the day <laughs> okay <laughs> if you had 43 seconds and you had the entire world on the line every single person on the line what would you tell them today's choices are tomorrow's outcomes if you make the best of today tomorrow will take care of itself okay that's <laughs> awesome and that's very succinct Life. i love it i love it i love it <laughs> People don't remember long things. They remember short things. That's true. That's true. 43 <laughs> seconds might be a little too much time. I'll start giving right. people 13 <laughs> seconds from now on. You just got a quick, <laughs> what, what three words would you say to the world? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's good. Yeah. And I want to make sure that your audience gets something. Um, I, I give a, I give a gift and that gift is a, uh, is the five F workbook. And okay. it's a gift, which means it's free, which means I don't even take an email address you just go to the link and you download the book because it's about giving value, not taking. And so it's basically corporateactionhero.com slash gift. Okay. I will put the and, link in the description too. Right. Because they can go there. They can get that. If they're going to be on my website anyway, just look around. I put out a daily video of motivation every day. That's why I've it's watched. called daily. Yeah. <laughs> every day. I've watched some of those. They're great. Uh, oh, thanks, I would, thanks. I would recommend my audience to go check some of those out. And, if, and you can find them on my website or you can find them on YouTube. They're on YouTube as well. Um, and I just put something out every day just because I think that just a little bit of things to ponder every day. And what they really are is, is I, I'm a big fan of quotes, 
quotations from people. So I, I go and I look at the quotes and I go, what do I think about this? And some days I debate it. I like, do I do this quote? I don't agree with it. So I'm going to talk about that. And some days I say, well, this is what I get out of this, you know? So it really comes down to, you know, bringing something for you to make your own choices about, because as my mom said, you know, your experience is, is your personal choice. And so you have to make your own personal choices and move forward. Right. Well, outstanding. So if anybody wants to get a hold of you, would you recommend the website? That's where they go. Corp- CorporateActionHero.com. You're going to find LinkedIn, Twitter, and all that stuff is there. Facebook is all there. You can connect on all those platforms just by finding those links there. But CorporateActionHero.com. And if you want to see some really interesting stuff, do some searches on CorporateActionHero.com and look at the, the – I started marketing through podcasts the end of January. Okay. And – I have, this is my 86th guest spot since January. Wow. And if you search John Davis, corporate action hero, and just look at how many times in the first 10 pages are are podcasts I've been on, you're going to find that 30% of the returns are my podcasts. Wow. Outstanding. So so you really want to think about how you're marketing in this new digital age because podcasts are huge. I love it. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much. I would love to have you back in a few months if you're still if you're still doing that. I I I will. You can find me on Pod on Podmatch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. Yes, I've got it. All right. Well, sounds good. Thank you, John. I appreciate your time with us. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Second Mix podcast once again. I am Matthew Bennett. You can uh, find this interview on the blog at secondmix.net. If you have any questions, send me an email at matt at secondmix.net. I would love to hear from you. Please give me five stars whenever and wherever you can. Subscribe to get notified about the latest episodes. And if you haven't yet, leave me a really nice review. If you know anyone who's going to find this information helpful or useful, please tell them about the show. I do this to help people. All of the links that we talked about in the show are going to be in the description And I'm going to be here every Monday and Thursday. So take steps that will make your week incredible. I will be back on Monday this weekend. Continue reflecting, revising, and remixing your life. I'll see you soon.